thousands of vulnerable children questioning their gender identity have been let down by a lack of research and remarkably weak evidence on medical interventions, according to a landmark NHS review. The report by paediatrician Dr Hilary Cass also says the toxicity of the debate around trans rights is not helping, with professionals afraid to discuss issues openly. Among the findings, 32 recommendations are calls for gender services for young people to match the standards of other NHS care and for better research into the characteristics of children seeking treatment. The first thing to appreciate is this is a very different population of young people from the young people who were presenting to gender services um, some 10 years ago. So the original cohort of young people was really predominantly children and predominantly birth registered boys and now the predominant group is birth registered girls presenting in early teens. Joining me in the studio now are Talk TV's political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald, hello Alicia, and Shivani Darfi, a presenter on Virgin Radio and trans advocate. Thank you both very much indeed for coming. Maybe we'll just get Alicia to set the scene and then Shivani will talk to you about your feelings about this report by Dr Cass. So, the scene is very turbulent, isn't it? And full of all sorts of anger and all kinds of pressure because this is an issue that has somehow exploded and become essentially loaded and for many people toxic. It has, and this is what that report by Dr Cass actually says. She says that because of where this argument has gone and the kind of toxicity and the heat involved in it, this has made the actual medical side of it really difficult. And the kind of underlying message of what she was saying in the report is that puberty blockers or just hormonal treatment should not be given to children uh, who are questioning their gender identity. And really, that isn't surprising in itself. I mean, it's the same with antidepressants. That's the advice with that. That shouldn't be the first port of call. You shouldn't just automatically go to the, the kind of medicinal cure of something before trying other measures. But this, what she was saying is that it's become really difficult for doctors to make that call because they're too scared to question things because of the heat around the debate. Uh, and Shivani, I mean, listening and watching and obviously waiting for this uh, report, it's been a long time coming, hasn't it? What, what have you felt about the, the, the uh, findings of Dr Cass? Yeah, four years in the making and I think it's a tricky one. There are definitely things in this report that are I see as great positives. You know, making sure the standard of care is equal to that of the other NHS services is what lots of people have been crying out for. Nowhere within the NHS should, should have a substandard level of care. And um, making sure there's more of a holistic approach when treating young people and patients in this way is great. And there are, there are a number of things where I think if implemented correctly with care, with training, could really benefit trans healthcare and, and just generally healthcare for young people who are questioning their gender identity, maybe not necessarily trans, all across England, because this is specifically in relation to England, not the whole of the UK. Yes. But I think it's one of those situations where if this guidance is taken <coughs> and used in maybe a slightly sloppy way or used to further an agenda, it's written in a slightly ambiguous way that means that it could cut some corners and it could lead to potentially, you know, worse situations for the young people. And I think... OK, let, let, let's kind of establish a little bit mm. about what it means to put a young person on puberty blocking drugs. So before we talk about what the drugs might do to the young person, let's talk about what the impetus is. Is it that the young person would want to be on these drugs? And if they would, why would they? What would they be trying to achieve by going on puberty blocking drugs? So there are a number of reasons people might go on puberty blockers. Sometimes, if you're a trans person, you would want to go on puberty blockers and you'd have that conversation with your GP, your parents, and together they would refer you to a specialist service, mm. um, which would essentially mean that you would then speak to a number of professionals who would decide whether or not this is something that you could go on or you should go on, and there are reasons why that may not be the right choice for you, but it may also be the right choice for you. But explain about so, why you might So you would to. go on those drugs because you uh, are going to go through a puberty that doesn't necessarily align with how you feel most comfortable with your body. Mm -hmm. For example, with people assigned female at birth, young girls, young women who are trans, they uh, see themselves 
as more masculine mm -hmm. and may not want to develop breasts, they may not want to develop hips, things like that. And so puberty blockers would pause that. And this is something that we see young girls taking if they go through an early puberty. For example, if they start going through puberty at seven or eight years old, mm -hmm. they're not trans kids. They're not trans people. They are born women, they identify as women, or they're born girls, they identify as girls, and they go on these drugs to pause their puberty for a few years so that they can develop at the rest of, at, at the time with the rest of their peers. Right. So trans people who want to go on these drugs want to pause their puberty so that when they're older, they may either choose to go through puberty, they might feel more comfortable with it, or they may want to go on hormones that allow them to develop in a way that their body doesn't naturally do. Just really quickly on that, and I think it's important to add this, because in the CAS report, something else that, that is highlighted is that we don't yet know all of the side effects of these puberty blockers, and that is a recommendation from Dr. Cass. She just says that these blockers should only be used in clinical trials. They have not been around for enough years. We <coughs> must simply know the kind of long-term effects of what these um, hormones actually well, do. Well, she says that they can do, do damage to bone growth, doesn't she? And, yeah. and, and, you know, various kind of physical harms might be done. And she says that the research into the medical, the physiological and anatomical effects of taking these drugs hasn't been completed mm -hmm. and that you wouldn't give adults drugs that hadn't been properly clinically trialled for the requisite length of time, nor should you do so for children. And the implication, Giovanni, is that the reason why young people have been given these and prescribed these puberty-blocking drugs is because there's such a high volume and level of pressure from the trans lobby to kind of facilitate people transitioning, and that this ideology has put doctors in a position where they have felt that they almost have no choice but to prescribe these drugs which haven't been yet properly clinically trialled. Do you, do, you, do you agree that that might be the case? I completely disagree that that's the case. Oh, you disagree? Yeah, I disagree. But I think there are children who are not trans who are accessing this medication. I do think that needs, more research needs to be done on this medication. We do need to understand the long-term effects of it, mm. but I, I disagree that this has come because of a trans lobby that are forcing doctors to prescribe medication. I think um, this has come at a time when we are seeing more and more awareness about transgender issues and transgender needs, yeah. and therefore we are trying to, I think, medically cope with the demand, now that we are more well-versed in being able to talk about trans issues, cope with the demand for this healthcare. And it's not something that we've actually got yet. So we've got doctors trying their best to help their patients. And we've got more and more people who identify as trans because there's more communication, awareness about these issues. And there isn't necessarily the research and the grounding in understanding how all of these things play out in the long term. Certainly one of the things it seems that, that, that Dr. Cass is saying is that extreme caution and indeed kind of slowness needs to be used when treating young people who may consider themselves to be trans, may think they want to transition, may be, you know, experiencing gender issues or concerns. And she seems to feel, I think, as if I've read every report I can all day on, on the report, without actually reading the report itself, which I don't have a copy of yet, but... Over 300 but, pages. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but, but she, she seems to say that, that one of the things that has happened is that action has been too precipitous. It's been, you know, a young person has presented at school or at the GP or to their parents and said, I don't identify as the gender I was born in. I would like to transition. And everyone goes hell for leather. You know, it's like, okay, right, right, let's get this going, right, let's let's establish this. Okay, let's put you on puberty blocking drugs. And that it's all going far too fast. And she's saying there needs to be just a gentler, much more cautious, much slower approach. And it seems to me that the thrust of this is that young people can experience so many different feelings and confusions and problems and troubles and, and you know, crises of all different kinds. And with time, with maturity, with age, they may decide very different things about what the solutions are to their problems. And one of them might be 
that they don't really want to transition after all. And I think that's what she's saying. Give young people much, much, much more time before drugs are prescribed to see what's really going on with them and what they might really want when they're mature enough to decide for themselves. Do you think that that has happened to people, that it's all gone too fast? No, I think um, there's a couple of different points that I want to touch on there. With it going too fast, I think um, it's not really the case because if you're getting treatment within the NHS, the wait lists are so long that what's actually happened to a lot of people is they've joined the wait list at 13 or 14 years old and they've had to be on that wait list before they've had any treatment for so long mm. that they then have to join the adult services wait list because oh. they've become 18. So what happens in those scenarios is those young people have to go through a puberty that they don't feel comfortable going through. And so if, if that's not slow enough, I don't know how much slower Dr. Cass wants this process to be. Right. I think another thing um, that you sort of touched on is the idea of people regretting or changing their mind. Mm. And there is research, there are studies that have shown that there are more people who regret getting knee surgery, corrective knee surgery, if they've had something going on with their knee, than there are people who have regretted transitioning. So yes, there are some people out there who have transitioned and regret that or want to detransition, but... <coughs> We don't say, oh, we should stop offering people knee surgeries because there are some other people out there who regret theirs. So, I mean, there have been outcries today about, you know, that this is a scandal almost on a level with the post office scandal or with the Windrush scandal, a scandal of young people being prescribed these puberty blocking drugs without adequate research, without really knowing the effect it's going to have on them, and that this is an appalling failing by the NHS. It, it seems as though, Shivani, you're really saying actually not enough young people have had access to these drugs. They should have been more readily available and it should have been quicker. Kind of everything the report's saying you're not really in tune with. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I think the report highlights some really good things. I think more holistic care does need to be considered. I think there does need to be more training when it comes to medical staff, when it comes to the people providing this care. And I definitely think more research does need to be done. But I don't think that or any of those things come at the expense of completely stopping trans healthcare for young people. Mm -hmm. And ju just, just to put before you a, an article I read today about a, a couple of parents who went to their, I think it was their, their, their daughter's prize giving at school or something, and they were looking forward to seeing their daughter, let's call her Caroline, win the prize. Only when it came to it, they called out a boy's name, I think it was Tommy, and Tommy went up to get the prize. But Tommy was their daughter, Caroline, and at school, Tommy was identifying as a boy and dressed as a boy with hair slicked back and looking completely different from the way their daughter, Caroline, did at home. And the parents were in every way shocked and horrified, I think mainly because no one had told them and the school had kind of allowed this to go on without seeing fit to call them in or discuss it with them or anything of that kind. So it came as a major shock to them. Um, and I wonder what you think of that story. Obviously, it's the kind of story written to, to, to cause a certain reaction in the people who read it. You're not meant to read it and just think, oh, that's OK. You're meant to think, oh, that was terrible. It's awful that the school did that. They should have told the parents. That's the way it's written. But I wonder what you think of that. I completely empathise with the parents. Like, I, I get that it would be a total shock. But I think also for this young person, they weren't ready to tell their parents. And so for the school to intervene and tell the parents on their behalf would have been... Uh, a way of stripping that young person of their autonomy. Really quickly, when I, when I was a kid, mm. I used to bind my chest um, because I wasn't comfortable with my body. I remember going to the year nine disco and I was wearing jeans and a hoodie and underneath that hoodie I had my chest bound. Other kids were doing similar things in terms of how they were expressing who they are. It's just they turned up with jeans and a hoodie and underneath the hoodie they were wearing a little crop top. Our, neither of our sets of parents knew what was going on underneath the hoodie. We all turned up to that school disco yeah. in clothes that made us feel slightly more comfortable about who we are. And we were experimenting with how we look and how we present in our own ways. And one is just a little bit more conventional than the other. And so I get why the parents would be shocked, but I also think that a lot of empathy needs 
to be with that young person. And if you were adding anything to the report yourself, if you wanted to put in just a kind of prelude or a prologue or a, uh, something that was your experience, your thoughts on all of this that you think needs to be taken into account that maybe didn't happen for you or doesn't happen for friends of yours or people that you know, that you think people should know about, they should realise and they should empathise or understand or do something about. Is there anything specific that you would say? I think the, the main thing, all the way through reading the report, any time any discussion around trans healthcare and trans young people is, is being had, the one thing that everyone needs to remember is that these are young people who are, you know, they deserve care, they deserve empathy, they are, it's hard enough being a teenager or even younger than that, and we need to make sure that their well-being is at the forefront of every conversation that's being had.